The first time I saw a skinwalker was in the summer of 2008. My friend and I were camping at a place called the Crags in southern Utah. It's basically just a big field with some boulders scattered around, but it's pretty secluded and has an old abandoned mining road that leads to it. We had been camping there for three days straight, so we knew the area pretty well. We were sitting on top of one of the large boulders by the road when we heard something come up from behind us. We both turned around to see what it was, and we saw this huge black dog walking towards us. It looked like a normal dog except for one thing. Its eyes glowed bright red in the dark, like cat's eyes do in the light. Oh yeah, and one other thing. It was walking upright. I've seen coyotes, wolves, and mountain lions before, and their eyes never glow like that. This thing looked like it could eat my golden retriever and me both without even breaking a sweat. So we decided to get out of there as fast as possible. We hopped off our rock and started running down the road away from this thing. When my friend stops dead in his tracks and says, oh shit. I turned around to see what he was looking at. And I see this skinwalker now standing on top of the boulders off to our left. It was just staring at us with those glowing red eyes. We slowly started backing away without turning our backs to it. We kept our flashlights on it the whole time in case we needed to turn and run. It stayed there for a few minutes and then it just jumped off the boulder and landed on all fours and started coming towards us. We turned around and started running as fast as we could down this road. We ran for about two minutes straight. I was so out of breath. When I finally turned around and looked behind us, I saw that it was no longer following us. We stopped running after that and stayed on high alert just in case it decided to come back for us. After about 15 minutes of walking, we made our way back to camp. We packed up and we got the hell out of there. I've never been back since. The following was told to me by my mother. She lived in a small town in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia called Montgomery, West Virginia. Her house was located on a hillside that overlooked the town and valley below. She lived there alone since my grandmother had passed away several years before this incident occurred. One night, she awoke to hear her dog growling at something outside her bedroom window, which faced the front of the yard in the street below. She got up to see what it was, but couldn't make anything out due to the darkness outside. So she turned on the light to the outside and looked again, but still she couldn't see anything. So she thought it must have been a stray cat or something and she went back to bed, thinking no more about it until she fell asleep again. Now sometime later, I don't know how much later, she was awakened again by her dog growling at something outside her bedroom window. But this time when she got up to look out into the darkness, all she could see were these two red glowing eyes staring back at her. She said they looked like bicycle reflectors. She said that whatever it was had long arms because its hands were resting on top of the fence post beside her driveway and its fingers were long enough that you could see them even though it was dark outside. She described them as being like monkey hands with very long fingers. She said that whatever it was stood there for several minutes just staring into her bedroom window while its eyes glowed red. Then after a while, it slowly backed down from the fence post then turned around and walked down the driveway towards the road. She said that she watched it as it walked away until it disappeared into the darkness at the end of her driveway. She said that she was so scared by this time that she ran back to bed and pulled the covers up over her head. The next morning when she got up and looked out her bedroom window, there was nothing to be seen anywhere outside. So she just went about her daily routine as if nothing happened. She never told anyone except for me about this incident because she thought they would think that she was crazy or just imagining things. This happened in July of 2012. I was camping with my family at a local state park. We were staying in a cabin that was about a mile from the main campground. It was late at night and I had just woken up to use the bathroom. I walked outside of the cabin and looked up at the sky. The stars were so bright, it was amazing. I stood there for a few minutes just looking at them, when suddenly something caught my eye. 
There is this bright light coming from behind the trees about a hundred yards away from me. At first, I thought it might be someone with a flashlight, but then I realized that it wasn't moving like one would move if they were walking around with one. This thing was hovering above those trees, and it seemed to be getting closer to me as time went on. I started to get scared because this thing didn't look like anything that I'd ever seen before. So I ran back inside the cabin and woke up my dad so he could see what I saw too. We both went outside together and we watched this thing hover over those trees for about five minutes until it finally came into an open field where we could see it better. It looked like this giant white orb floating in midair with no lights or anything on it, just pure white glowing light all around it. My dad said, what is that? Then all of a sudden, this loud humming noise started coming from whatever this thing was. Almost like an engine revving up or something similar to that. But it sounded louder than any car or truck engine that I've ever heard. Then, two more orbs appeared next to the first one. They were smaller than the first one, but still very large orbs. Just floating in there without any lights on them either. All three of these things just hovered there for like another 10 minutes while making these very loud noises until they finally just shot off into the sky at incredible speeds. We watched them go until they disappeared into space somewhere really high above us. After they left, my dad told me not to tell anybody about what we saw, so we never did tell anybody else about what happened that night. Well, except for my mom and my little brother. I want to share a really terrifying experience I had recently, camping in the Mayaka River State Park in Florida. It's a really neat place to go, but you need to be vigilant about the wildlife, mainly alligators and snakes. My girlfriend and I have a dog, but we never bring her to this spot. It seems like too much of a risk, so my brother dog sits for us. At this park, they allow you to backcountry camp, which is great, because Mimi and I don't like crowds. We got a permit for three nights to celebrate our fifth anniversary of living together. We hiked about a mile, loaded down with supplies and found a sweet spot near the river. It was a little patch of a clearing surrounded by trees. The ground there was sand and that suited me. I like camping in the sand here because there's less of a chance that you'll accidentally step on a snake. The first night we were hanging around our campfire just talking. Then we heard this sound coming from the trees behind us. It sounded like a little girl laughing. Now right off, that frustrated me, thinking that some people had set up their camp nearby in the same time since we arrived. It was pretty late, maybe about 10.30 at night, so it wasn't likely that someone was just passing through. A few minutes later, we heard it again, a child's laugh, only this time it was coming from the other direction, from the direction of the river, which made no sense at all. I asked Mimi which direction she thought it was coming from, but she shook her head saying it was too hard to tell. I let it go. We went to bed about an hour later, kicking sand over the fire to put it out. The moon was new, just a sliver, so there wasn't much light to see. We settled in and I put a flashlight near the entrance of the tent, in case one of us had to pee. It's not a good idea to walk around in the scrub brush in the middle of the night and I made sure to remind Mimi to stay on the sand just to be careful. It's pretty comfy in our tent, and we both fell asleep almost right away. The next thing I know, Mimi is leaning over me, shaking me awake. She whispered that she heard someone walking around our campsite. I listened and instantly heard it too. Just a small scuffing sound, like someone shuffling through the sand. I sat up and grabbed the flashlight, unzipped the tent, and stuck out my head. I was really hoping it wasn't a gator. I didn't see a thing, but now I had to pee from the rush of anxiety. Mimi said she was okay if I went, so I slipped on my sneakers and got out of the tent, going to the edge of the clearing in a straight line staying on the lookout. Luckily, no snakes or gators in sight. While I'm out there, I suddenly hear it again. A little girl's laugh, just a giggle really. Very soft, which is super freaky, because now it's about 3 in the morning. The hairs on my back of my neck stood up. I waved my light around, but I didn't see anyone and I got back to the tent as soon as I could. When I got back there, Mimi was all snuggled down in her sleeping bag again. I asked her if she heard the laughter and she just said no, kind of half asleep. 
I fell asleep while still wondering about it. I woke up first thing the next morning and decided to surprise her by having coffee already made. I was crouched by the stove about 10 feet from the tent when I remembered the giggling from last night. While the water was heating, I walked around the edge of the clearing, inspecting the sand. I saw my own footprints in a straight line from the tent where I had gone and come back. But there was another set, very small and going around the back of our tent. I crouched down to look. It was a human's bare foot, but small like a child's. Okay, I have to admit, that really creeped me out. But not nearly as much as what I saw next. There is a tic-tac-toe game drawn in the sand, about two feet off to the right side of the tent, with an X drawn in one corner. I woke up Mimi. Did you draw it? I asked her as soon as she opened her eyes. The tic-tac-toe game in the sand. I could tell the answer just by the look on her face. She shook her head no. I brought her out to it and told her about the footprints too. She was quiet for a minute and then looked at me all suspicious. Are you trying to freak me out? She asked. I was shocked. I promised her that it was real. I would never do anything to wreck our vacation. It was our anniversary. She was quiet for a minute, thinking, and then reached out and drew an O next to the X. I looked at her like, what are you doing? She said, if someone is messing with us, let's see what they'll do next. I couldn't think of anything to refute that, so I just let it alone. We sat there drinking coffee, both of us mulling it over. I then asked her if she thought the footsteps in a tic-tac-toe game were related to the little girl's laugh. She was quiet for a minute but then shrugged without answering. I knew it disturbed her and I wanted this to be a good trip so I just dropped the subject. Later that afternoon I was thinking, we would never know if a person came back unless we erased all the previous tracks. I mentioned it to Mimi and she agreed. Together we walked around the clearing, scuffing sand all over the marks. But then we left the tic-tac-toe game where it was. I know she was more shaken than she was letting on. I tried to be affectionate, but she was just too jittery. So we spent kind of a quiet evening staring into the campfire with both of us lost in our own thoughts. When Mimi started to fall asleep in her camp chair, I woke her up gently and suggested we both go to bed. I picked up the flashlight and guided her over to the tent, telling her I'd douse the fire myself and I'd be right there. As Mimi was unzipping the tent, I shined my beam over to that game drawn in the sand and froze. The sand looked freshly disturbed. I walked over and looked. Mimi had seen me and now was with me, clinging to my shirt. There was another X drawn in the game. I flashed the light around at the woods, half expecting to see someone, but there was nobody there. I zigzagged the light around on the sand, walking a few feet away in either direction. There were no footsteps near the tic-tac-toe game at all. I was really shaken up now, but I didn't want to let on to Mimi how scared I was. I got her safely into the tent and doused the fire, then went to bed myself, but I couldn't sleep. I just laid there listening, barely breathing. I was just rigid with anxiety. I could tell by Mimi's breath she wasn't sleeping either. I never heard anything else, and I finally fell asleep around dawn. Mimi woke me up around 7, shaking my shoulder. She said she wanted to go home. She said she had already been out to look at everything, and that the tic-tac-toe game had been erased and the sand smoothed over. I got up and looked around again, and also didn't see any footprints except for Mimi's and mine. She was really freaked out. I was happy just to get the hell out of there too. We packed up in no time and hit the trail. When we got home, I found a forum for camping enthusiasts on Google, so I joined and related my story. It was only a day later that someone replied. This user said that they had heard a story about that state park. Back in the 70s, a little girl camping with the Girl Scouts had been dragged into the river by an alligator and killed. I searched the internet and I can't find any account that that story is in any news archives, but I can't help to think that it might be true. It would explain a lot. If anyone out there is familiar with that event, maybe they could add it in the comments with a link to the news story if possible. Thanks in advance. Hello, Donovan. I was reminded of these experiences while listening to your show, I think. Or maybe Mr. Ballin's channel. Someone was describing recurring experiences 
that were very similar to mine. Whosever show it was, you might find this interesting. My sister and I spent our childhood summers at my mom's cousin's ranch in Montana. We and her cousins would ride horses through the woods for hours at a time. We would all head out, doubled up on horseback, and ride on siding roads along pastures and hayfields, and into the national forest following old logging roads. There were usually four of us, sometimes up to six, and we often had our cousins' dogs along too. I remember the first time I saw what we referred to as the phantom of the fork in the road. I remember coming out of our family's timbered property into a clearing that had two other dirt pathways kind of spoking out of a gated fence. You could go straight ahead on the same small dirt road we were on, veer to the left, or veer right and have to climb down from your horse and open a barbed wire and log gate to continue into the National Forest land. Our route took us right. When riding up to the clearing, you had a good view of the entire scene from a ways back. The fork was entirely empty of people and animals. We were all riding and chatting, and then one by one we all got quiet as our minds adjusted to what we were seeing. It was like blinking a blurry image into focus. Where we had all been looking, as we emerged from the timber line, there had been nothing. Then a man began to shape right at the fork. He was just standing there in a plaid flannel, work pants and boots. The thing that spooked me as a kid was that he carried a rifle in his hand. We slowed the horses but continued toward the clearing, as we wanted to open the gate road into the forest service land. My sister, several years older than me, asked our cousin, do you know who that is? She replied, no, but he never bothers us. I remember thinking that it was alright, considering our cousins had run into him before. I don't recall if the dogs were there with us this time, but the horses did respond strangely. We passed within 12 or 15 feet of him as we rode up to the gate. He appeared very solid. He was very real looking. You can make out the seams and buttons on his clothing and the tooling of his rifle sling. My oldest cousin dismounted and opened the gate and we all rode through leading her horse. We turned to watch her close the gate and the man was still standing back there where we had first seen him watching us. My cousin got back on her horse and we took a final glance up to the man, but he wasn't there. It couldn't have been more than 8 or 10 seconds from the last time we saw him. There was nowhere he could have moved that quickly and quietly. We would have seen or heard him run off. I didn't think much of it, I was just more excited to keep riding. But I remember the older kids, the oldest one was 16 years old, being pretty weirded out by it. One of my cousins said, yep, yeah, that's what he does. This was not a one-time event. It happened at least four more times over about six summers. Always the same man, same place, same clothing, and same gun. The same image coming into focus as we rode by, and then looking back at nothing. The last time I saw the Phantom, my cousin and I were riding alone. The exact same thing happened as had unfolded all those times before. He never spoke to us, and we never spoke to him. The dogs never seemed to even notice him. I went back in my 20s to see if maybe I could conjure him up, but I never saw him. I just wanted to see with the advantage of adulthood what those experiences had been and either try to come up with a rational explanation or be convinced that he really was a paranormal being. Hey there, Donovan. I love all the stories that you tell great work giving us these videos. I've been listening to yours and Lilith's channel for a while now, and I keep wondering what story I'll send in first. I have a few encounters, anything from ghosts to UFOs. We'll start with a ghost one. This story took place in Hardyville, South Carolina, around 2009 at a house my mom and stepfather built. My stepfather, we will call him Roy, had gotten a call that his cousin had passed away suddenly due to a gruesome car accident. He made plans to take the day off for the funeral coming up. The day of the funeral, my mom and Roy let me stay home since I was still kind of young and didn't really know the guy. So I stayed home and finished painting the hallway walls and the trim for my mom. 
and listen to the radio as I work. I was probably 15 at the time. Nothing new was staying home alone. I was an only child and matured quickly, so I was pretty responsible. A few hours went by and they arrived back home. I just want to mention, even though I was still painting, I didn't have any windows open. We had central air with good circulation, and it was pretty cold outside, so I kept them closed. We also had no pets at the time. As they walked in the door, I was finishing up at the kitchen sink, washing out my paintbrush. I asked them how the funeral went and how everything was. With my parents both being behind me talking, the door from the other side of the house slammed out of nowhere. Now I've heard doors slam. This was no measly slam. Whichever door slammed, it shut so hard you would have thought the frame cracked. It hurt my ears on the other side of the house. Right after that happened, we all looked at each other with a bewildered and scared look on our faces. My stepfather is a pretty straightforward guy, doesn't really believe in anything supernatural. My mom and I, however, grew up seeing and hearing spirits, so we were certainly believers. So the next step was for someone to go back to the other end of the house to see which door it was and the cause. Roy's face was a little ashen, and he didn't volunteer. I made a cross on my heart right after and started praying that whatever did that would get the hell out of there. I certainly wasn't brave enough to volunteer, so my brave mother volunteered herself. She walked down the hallway and made her way through all the rooms, all the closets, and the bathroom by herself to check things out. A few minutes later, I hear her coming back down the hall. When she makes it back to the kitchen where Roy and I were, I see the look on her face and it looks unsettled. I asked her whose door was shut, mentally hoping it wasn't mine. She said, they're all open. Nothing else happened that day, but we were all kind of on edge for a while. Maybe it was Roy's cousin saying goodbye in an odd way. Maybe it was the house itself. A lot of weird things happened there, even though it was a new build. I think it was the land or Roy causing it. Roy wasn't a good guy, so I'm thinking something manifested from his darkness, or the land had some history. I have a few more stories, including the same house that I'll send in. Thanks again, Donovan. I listen to you daily as I'm doing chores around the house, and I love all your content. Take care. Me and my family have been in the Atchafalaya Basin hundreds of years, I guess. Far back as we can figure, we've been shrimping, crabbing, and crawfishing these parts, living on a houseboat with power from a generator. Ever since I can remember, I've been hearing stories about the Lou Guru. I think it's the same thing other people call a dog man. I was told the Lou Guru mostly goes after kids who are bad, so I always thought it was just a story people made up to keep their kids in line. Now, I'm not so sure about that. See, my brother Jim and I got a shrimp boat, and we go out before the sun rises until after the sun sets during shrimp season. You gotta get them during those few weeks because after that, they're gone for the year. The rest of the year, we can get crabs and crawfish, but we make most of our money from the shrimp. It's a lot of work tossing that net out of the boat, hauling it back in, and getting the shrimp out of it. I don't pay a lot of attention to what's out there in the swamp, but every once in a while late at night, we hear a howl, and Jim will say, that's the Lou Guru. I never believed him, but I also can't explain the noise, because it doesn't sound like a dog, a wolf, or a coyote. I never thought about it too much until we started bringing Timmy along. Timmy is Jim's kid, he's 11, but he caught on quick to sorting out the shrimp we keep from all the other stuff that gets caught in the net like turtles and fish and whatever. I heard the howl more often when Timmy started joining us. Jim stopped saying that's the Lou Guru, probably so he wouldn't scare Timmy. Maybe that made me notice it even more. I started ignoring it because we were hearing that howl every night. It sounds weirdly human. It was creepy, but I guess I got used to it. Besides, we were busy, like I said, hauling in the nets. One late afternoon though, we passed by this small piece of marshy land, and I saw something standing on it, like near the water. I thought it was a person, but it had these weird curved legs. Then it threw back its head. First I noticed this long dog-like snout, 
Then I heard the howl. Jim was driving the boat and he must have heard it over the engine because he turned in the other direction as fast as he could, which wasn't that fast. I had plenty of time to see the thing lower its head and stare at us with these yellow demonic eyes. I felt like it was looking at Timmy, he behind me. I hoped he didn't notice the thing, but I guess he did because he looked scared too. We were headed toward another shrimping spot, and when we got there, we all started working like nothing happened. Jim took a different route back because we finished for the night. We wouldn't pass by that spot again if we could help it. But then, on the way back, I saw it again. Its fur looked all silver in the full moon. I didn't even think about there being a full moon right then. It almost looked like the moon was a spotlight trained on it. I could see everything, these big muscles under this thick fur, and pointy dog-like ears. I'm pretty sure it was taller than a person too. Maybe seven, seven and a half feet tall, judging by the trees near it. So that was scary enough, but then it showed its teeth. They glinted like swords in the moonlight. They were huge. I could imagine the hole they would make in a person. Jim turned the boat again, but just as he did, this thing leaped into the air and sailed towards us. It was a long jump, maybe 10 feet. I thought there was no way that it would make it to the boat. You can guess I wouldn't be telling this if it didn't make it. It did, just barely. It slammed into the side of the boat, with its front legs gripping the side and the back legs dangling below. I stood there frozen, watching it try to scramble up. I think my brain wouldn't process what was going on. But I finally caught on to the fact that if I didn't move quick, that thing would be up on the deck attacking us. I ran over to the deck and started kicking at its front legs. It snarled at me and pulled its head up, trying to bite my feet. All this time, Jim was driving the boat as fast as it will go, which really isn't that fast. Plus, he had to watch out not to ground the boat. In this marsh, land can kind of sneak up on you. Even though we weren't going that fast, that thing must have been really strong to hang on while we were moving. I had on thick rubber shrimp boots, but one of those teeth caught and made a hole in it. Later on, I doubted what really happened. I looked at the hole in those boots and I knew it was real. After it made the hole, I used the bottom of the boot to kick harder, right into its face. It tried to bite the boot again, but the bottom was too hard. It couldn't get a grip. I managed to pull my foot back and kick it again. This time, I must have somehow gotten it exactly in the right spot, because it fell back into the water. I didn't see it come back up, but I think it probably did. I reckon at some point I'll see it again. I got a feeling it's not gone forever. I'm not sure how to tell this story in any way that anyone will believe. As far as I know, I'm the only person to ever come across this creature. Nobody I've ever talked to has ever even heard of the thing. And I can't find anything online where it's run into anyone else. I still don't know what I saw though. I saw it plainly with my own eyes in broad daylight, so there's no way I confused it with anything else. Let me back up for a minute. I'm a longtime listener of your show, and I tune in regularly from my home in Arkansas. This story, though, takes place a little east of home on Real Foot Lake in the northwestern corner of Tennessee. I love to fish, and I was out in the lake one day last summer, trying my hardest to hook a couple big catfish. For a fish fry, I'd promise my brothers, who had promised to come visit me the next weekend. The fish finder on my boat was telling me that there were several large fish swimming directly underneath me. So even though it was the hottest part of the day, I was hungry and thirsty, and about out of ice water. I wasn't moving until I at least caught one or two. It was a sweltering hot day, and I was all alone on the boat. In fact, I hadn't seen another boat in well over an hour by the time I saw what I saw. I grabbed the last bottle of ice water I had out of the cooler and took a seat at the front of the boat. I casted out my line and sat quiet, waiting for a tug on my line. As I wiped the sweat off my face, something came up and bumped the underside of the boat. It was a fairly hard bump, enough to knock me out of my seat, and definitely hard enough that I felt I needed to scoot over and look down into the water to try to figure out what it was. 
At my first glance, I couldn't see anything. I gave up scanning the water for something big and went back to my seat to take another swig of my ice water. I figured it must have been just a tree underneath the water's surface that I had just passed over. Now just as I almost sat back down though, there was another major bump under the boat. This time I dropped my water bottle, spilling the last of it out into the bottom of the boat. As you can imagine, this made me pretty mad, so I went back to the boat's edge to search again. This time, I was committed to find the culprit, even if it was hard for me to see. I decided to grab one of the oars and pushed around under the boat a minute to see if I could get anything to come up. When I stuck the oar under the boat though, something grabbed onto it tight, only for a second or two. Then I pulled the oar back up to find the entire paddle of it was missing. Whatever was under my boat had bit that thing clear in two. This is about the time I decided to go ahead and start the boat motor and get the hell out of there. I couldn't imagine what it might be. My initial thought was that some Tennessee hillbilly wacko had cut loose a pet alligator or something. The motor turned over only once before it died. I tried again and it died again. The third time, I couldn't even get it to turn over. I pulled the prop out of the water to see if something was stuck and saw that all the blades were bent. I picked up my phone to call for help, and that's when the damn thing started to come up for air. Under my boat, and I am not kidding you on this, there was a snapping turtle at least 15 feet wide. Well, it looked like a snapping turtle, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. Its head was as big as my torso. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it was there right in front of me. I was so afraid that this thing was going to tip over my boat. Then it submerged itself back into the water and my boat was about to tip over from the current of this thing submerging itself. I took out my other oar and finally got myself to shore. It took me a while on my way back to the shore with only one oar and no motor. Keep in mind it was hot as hell that day. I was so dehydrated by the time I got to the shore. None of my friends believed me but I swear that's what I saw. I work as a janitor at a high school in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's a small graveyard across the street. I thought it looked pretty old. I never bothered to go look at the gravestones until I had a reason to. I'll get to that reason in a minute. I started working there a few months ago, and for the first month, it was a normal job. I come in around 3 after school's done for the day, clean until 8 or so, or whenever I finish up. It was pretty boring and as you can imagine, I usually listen to a podcast or music, whatever I'm in the mood for. As it happens, when things started to get strange, I was listening to a mystery podcast, probably because it was around Halloween. So I'm listening to this creepy story and I turn around with my mop in my hand and trip over this white cat. We get a lot of stray cats around here since the winters are so mild, but I hardly ever see a white cat especially one like this that was all white. It was long-haired and well-fed, looked like a pet, not a stray. I thought it was probably just visiting, wandering around or whatever, and it would go home soon. When I left, it walked out and down the street, cool as you please, toward the graveyard. It disappeared into the graveyard. I thought it must have gone to one of the houses behind it, since it did look like somebody's pet. I didn't expect to see it again, but it showed up again the next night and trailed me for my whole shift. So now I'm thinking it had to be lost or it's a stray. I took a picture of it and put it up on the lost animal's social media pages, just in case. When I went out to my truck to go home, it went off toward the graveyard again. The day after that, I brought a can of cat food with me, and when the cat showed up, I opened the can and put it in front of it. The cat just walked away from it. I thought maybe it didn't like the food, so I brought some tuna next time. Every cat likes tuna. Not this one, though. I still didn't think there was anything weird about the cat, though. I hadn't figured out what was going on. I just thought someone else might be feeding it. But if that was true, then why was it hanging around? Sure, it was a little chilly outside, especially at night, but if it was cold, why did it always leave when I did? Maybe I thought it wanted attention, so I decided to try to pet it. 
but every time I reached down, it managed to sidestep and avoid my hand. I kept trying though, and I finally got it cornered. It wasn't scared, like it didn't hiss or anything, but it gave me this look, as if it was saying, do you really want to do this? And I reached for it, but my hand went right through. I couldn't believe it. I reached out again, and it sidestepped. That was when I had the thought, this is not a real cat. Okay, so what is it? And what did it want? I felt like it wanted something because it kept coming around and following me. Not food, not attention, so what? I felt like it was trying to tell me something. Every night, it walked back toward the graveyard. So one night, I followed it. But when I got to the graveyard, it walked behind one of the stones and was gone. Since I was already there, I started to look at those stones. They were kind of messed up, dirty, and so on. But it was dark, so I really couldn't read them. I looked around trying to figure out where that cat could have gone. There are a couple houses past the cemetery. I guessed it must have gone to one of them. I tried not to think about the fact that it looked like it had just disappeared. I couldn't help it though. I kept thinking about that cemetery. Finally, one Saturday, I decided to clean it up. I loaded up the truck with everything that I thought I'd need. A weed trimmer, bleach, cloths, a pressure washer. I never cleaned gravestones before, but I cleaned everything else, so I figured I could handle it. I wasn't out there 10 minutes before people started just showing up to help. One lady even brought flowers to put on the graves when we were done. I asked a few people if they knew anyone who lost a white cat. No one did, but a couple people said they had seen one hanging around the graveyard. Never during the day though, only at night. When we were done, the place looked great. Before we left, I took a look at the stone the cat had disappeared behind. The name didn't mean anything to me. But an old guy behind me said, I knew him. He was a janitor at the school. I saw that he died in 1955, age 72. On Monday, the cat didn't show up. I kind of missed it as I cleaned. I mean, it never did anything except for follow me around while I worked. But still, it was some kind of company. I found myself looking for it every time I finished cleaning one room and started another. When it was time to leave, I stood outside for a minute looking toward the graveyard. Finally, I saw the cat walking toward me. It didn't come all the way, just up to the sidewalk. It meowed, the first time I ever heard it do that. Then it went back to the graveyard. I never saw it again, but once every few months, I go over to the graveyard and clean off those stones. You know, I think that's all it wanted me to do. I want to start by saying I love your show. I'm a bit of a recluse, and I live in a cabin about 30 acres outside of Paducah, Kentucky, in a wooded area. My wife and I believe in self-sustaining and get a lot of our food from natural resources around us. This is why I was out in the woods alone on the morning of June 12, 2019. I was hunting rabbits to make my wife's favorite rabbit stew for her birthday. I know what you're thinking. A crazy couple living in the woods eating rabbit stew for a birthday celebration probably aren't the most reliable source for a story about a Sasquatch. But let me challenge that. Who better would know what goes on out in the woods than us? We're here all of the time. Given that, it was no surprise to me that I ran into one on that June morning. We'd seen evidence of them long before that. Hair caught in high hanging tree branches, large footprints in the mud, even a few crude tools made from hollowed out tree trunks with sharpened rocks. We knew they were out there, but we never went looking for them specifically. We respected their peace and they respected ours. As I was hunting rabbit though, that morning I heard this slight rustling in the bushes in the woods. When I aimed the gun though, thinking it was a rabbit about to hop into my line of sight, I noticed instead a hairy little foot pulling itself back under the brush to hide. It was small, child-sized, and I knew there was only one explanation for it. Although I couldn't see it, I was standing within feet of a baby Sasquatch. You know what they say about don't mess with the baby bear because mama's somewhere watching. That's exactly what I was thinking right then. As much as I wanted to poke through and take a look, I didn't want to put myself into any danger. I kept my eye out but didn't see any adults, not even as I slowly walked away from where the baby was hiding. 
When I got pretty far from the bush, I yelled out simply, you're safe, baby, I wouldn't hurt you. Then I turned and headed back toward the house. I heard a strange sound from behind me when I turned, a sort of a cooing or a woo sound, but I didn't turn back to look. I did manage to get a rabbit on the way home and made the stew. My wife and I sat on the porch that night looking at the stars, and I told her all about that baby Sasquatch I run into earlier. As I was talking, we looked out across our small yard and noticed something strange move in the distance. It was hard to make it out at first, so I grabbed some binoculars from inside. Sure enough, at the edge of the tree line, that baby Sasquatch stood watching us. I guess its curiosity had been piqued during our run-in earlier in that day. I passed the binoculars to my wife, and she also took a look. We waved at the little guy, but it caused him to turn and leave. That night, my wife and I left fruit and bread on the back step, and Casey came back. It was gone the next morning. We've been leaving treats out for our friend ever since. We haven't been able to get an up-close look at him, but we do see him from time to time at a distance. He's grown up to be over five feet tall now, and has learned to wave back at us when we wave to him. In general, Sasquatches seem to be gentle and caring breed all around. It's my firm belief that if people didn't spend so much time hunting for them, they wouldn't be as scared and we would probably see them a lot more often. I'm always fascinated by everyone's encounters and never in a million years did I think I'd have an encounter to share myself. I was hesitant to reach out, but I think it might be therapeutic in some way and help me deal with the trauma of what happened that night. You see, I was recently going through a breakup and spent a good amount of time pouting and depressed. My best friend Alex wanted to cheer me up and suggested we spend a weekend at his uncle's remote cabin in the forest near Mount Shasta. Now, I'm not the outdoors type, but I had to admit, getting out of the city sounded like a great idea. We left the Bay Area on a Friday morning and began our long drive. On the way, Alex told me Mount Shasta was known for its strange occurrences. Some of it centered around Native American folklore, but there were also reports of mysterious disappearances, strange lights in the sky, and even Bigfoot. There were also legends of an ancient city hidden deep underneath Mount Shasta itself. I wasn't sure if he was just joking, and I wondered why he didn't tell me this before I agreed to the trip. He claimed his uncle never reported anything strange. In the few times that he had been there as a kid, he hadn't seen anything either. I laughed it off because I certainly didn't believe it. We got to the cabin in the afternoon and decided to go on a hike. Alex knew a great spot where we could see a spectacular sunset. Before heading out, we packed a cooler. The weather was gorgeous, and the fresh air really helped me clear my head. About 20 minutes into the hike, I sensed something wrong. But Alex didn't seem to notice anything. He was rambling on about work problems when I realized how quiet the forest had become. No insects, no nothing. Just stillness. Suddenly, we were assaulted by this horrible smell. It was like a strong, musky body odor, but mixed with urine and rotting garbage. We weren't sure where it was coming from and continued on, hoping we'd just pass it by. Soon after, we found a half-eaten deer carcass. It was fresh enough so that the blood was still wet. Alex joked that we stumbled into Bigfoot's lair, but I didn't find it particularly funny. The day that I had been enjoying quickly went away. I was worried about bears and mountain lions and suggested we go back. That's when we heard it. A loud, ungodly screech, unlike anything I've ever heard before. Just thinking about it now gives me goosebumps. It wasn't human, that's for sure, and it echoed all around us. This was our cue to leave. We blazed down the trail, and when we finally got to the cabin, we were out of breath. We looked at each other and laughed, but we didn't talk about it. Instead, we had a drink to calm our nerves and we lit up the grill. We soon forgot about what happened, and Alex had me cracking up as we reminisced about our high school days. I lost track of time, and we sat on the deck under the blanket of stars. It was pretty late when we heard it again, that creepy screeching sound. This time, it was followed by these loud whooping-like noises. It sounded like it was pretty close. We froze, and I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. 
There was this rustling in the trees around us, and we dropped everything and ran into the cabin. Alex locked the door and grabbed two of his uncle's hunting rifles. I had never used a gun before and didn't even know how to load the thing. He tried to show me, but the bullets just fell all over the floor. I glanced out the window and thought I saw a lumbering silhouette duck into the trees, but I couldn't be sure. It would have been easy for my mind to play tricks on me, but there was no mistaking the hideous sounds that thing was making. Something heavy hit the side of the cabin and shook the walls. Alex and I were scared out of our minds, and we huddled behind this couch in the middle of the living room. Then there was this wet splat against the window, as these whooping sounds became even more frenzied. We were too scared to look up and stayed hidden as something kept banging the cabin, again and again. I swear I thought that thing was going to break through the walls and rip us apart. It seemed like it went on forever, but I had no sense of time. At some point, all the commotion stopped, and I only remember waking up as the sun was rising. Everything was quiet. Alex was knocked out next to me, so I woke him up. We went outside to investigate and we finally saw what had been banging the cabin the previous night. Something was throwing torn pieces of a deer carcass. Its guts had also been flung against the window and the cabin was smeared with blood. This horrifying image has been seared into my brain ever since. Alex and I got out of there. As I jumped in the car, I noticed these huge footprints in the dirt around the perimeter. I didn't say anything. In fact, Alex and I didn't talk for the entire four and a half hours it took us back to get to the Bay Area. I haven't seen him since, and he won't even return my calls. If there's one thing I can say, at least the experience made me forget about the breakup. It just seems so insignificant in comparison. Actually, everything does. Well, thanks for letting me share my story. Getting it off my chest really helps. This experience I had when I was a kid has always really haunted me, because nothing about it made any sense, but I'm glad I can at least share it here. I grew up in rural Illinois, so I had always been used to country life, but when I was a teenager, I went to house sit for my grandparents. They lived in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. It was at least an hour away from anyone that I knew. I wasn't all that excited about being alone, but the money was good. I had actually begged them to let me do it. When I got there, I got the house all locked up and the curtains closed so that I'd feel secure in that remote location. All there was to see in any direction was corn pretty much. I got settled in and was trying to get some of my school assignments done. I started to hear something that sounded like the back doorknob jiggling, but I convinced myself I had imagined it. But then, a little while later, I heard a definite sound of something whimpering outside. At first, I thought it was one of the cats, but then I realized it sounded more human. I tried to peek through the curtains, but I couldn't see anything at all. The crying kept getting louder and sounded more and more like a person. It actually sounded like a kid to me. I decided I'd better find out if someone was lost out there or something. So I opened up the curtains all the way and saw a girl that was lying on the deck crying. I unlocked the door and threw it open, but as soon as she heard me, she jumped up and started shrieking while looking at me right in the eye. I was really taken back, but I wanted to help her. At that point, the little girl's face started changing, and it looked like it aged about a hundred years in the space of a few seconds. I know that sounds impossible, but it was like watching a time-lapse film. She suddenly looked like an old hag. She didn't really look solid. It was like I could almost see through her. I slammed the door shut again and locked it and ran into the kitchen. I didn't know what to do, so I called my dad and told him that he needed to come out there, even though he had told me when I took the job that I'd better be sure I wanted to be out there alone. He said he would come, but said I was probably psyching myself out about a random old woman. He told me to go ahead and call the police just in case. While I was calling, the woman started banging on the window. I thought for sure she was going to break it. When I hung up the phone, I went and hid in the pantry. It had a door with a little window so I could keep an eye out. Plus, there were knives in there. Not that I think I could even use the knife against somebody. I was going to have to wait because the police station was pretty far away. It was really freaking me out that she was banging on the window so hard like that. 
But after a while, the banging stopped and it was completely quiet. I couldn't stand just to stay sitting in the pantry. I came out really quietly to peek out of the curtains. Her face was right there staring at me, but it was the face of a little girl again. She gave me this bizarre grin. Then she turned and she climbed up on the deck railing and jumped off. I ran outside. It was about 15 feet to the ground. But when I looked over, there was nothing there. And there was no sound of crying or screaming either. Eventually, a police officer showed up. But he didn't seem to take me very seriously. I mean, I'm sure the story I was telling sounded really out there. He did about a 10 minute sweep of the property and said he couldn't find any threat. It was a big farm with outbuildings and acres of corn, and he barely shone his flashlight around a few of the closer sheds. At least he agreed to stay with me until my dad got there. By the time my dad showed up, it was getting pretty late. He turned all the floodlights on outside and told me to go inside and try to relax. He was going to sit out on the deck with his shotgun. As soon as I got to the bedroom, this ungodly wailing started sounding from the cornfields. I ran back out and my dad and I were looking out over the railing. I looked down to where the girl had jumped and saw this dark stain on the ground. It hadn't been there when I looked before. We went down and looked at it. It was just a wet patch of dirt. I was expecting it to be blood, but there was no reason for it to be wet right there. It was totally inexplicable. The wailing just stopped. By then, my dad and I were both so jumpy, we both stayed out there watching until sunrise. In the morning, we looked through all the buildings and found no sign of anyone. There was no sign of that woman ever again, but she absolutely terrified me. There were no missing person reports or anything. I was so traumatized after that. I couldn't rationalize why such a freakish thing had to happen when I was out there by myself. For a long time afterwards, I hated being alone. I couldn't stop thinking about that apparition or whatever that was. I just wanted things to make sense. I haven't been able to share my story publicly, so I'm really glad that I found your channel. My friends and family have not been so understanding, but I know your audience may have some insight as to what happened to me. I've thought about this incident nearly every day for the past 15 years, and I still don't know exactly what happened. I do believe I experienced a rip in the space-time continuum, or some other less cliche version of that. All I know is that one moment the sky was blue, then the next it was night. It happened when we were staying at my grandma's house in rural Pennsylvania during the summer. It's really just Amish country where they live and the roads are often filled with horses and buggies. When I was a kid, I loved going out to my grandma's house because it was just so different from the life that I lived in New York City. So we'd been there for over a week at this point, and my mom and older brother had been arguing really bad the whole time. We had some lunch and my brother had criticized my mom's cooking. They were in a shouting match, so I decided I needed to get out of the house. Grandma had a small wooded area behind her house, and I loved going out there to explore. After her manicured lawn, a small creek divided the woods from the property. There was a thick tree branch stretched across a brook, so I used that to hop over the water, and also used some big rocks as additional stepping stones. Once I got over to the stream and into the woods, I basically just meandered about on my usual pass. Some time ago, my brother and I had set up a treehouse. So I decided I'd go and try to find it to see if it was still standing. I walked about five minutes into the woods and reached the large oak tree that once held our makeshift treehouse. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, it was in total shambles. And I decided that it'd be foolish to climb up there. So instead, I started to turn around and walk back to the house, thinking that I'd tell my brother what it looked like. When I reached the creek this time, there was a faint white glow coming from the water. I thought that was weird, but I just figured it was the angle of the sun or something. I mean, the water looked normal except the edges and the ripples almost shined and sparkled in the light. Also, the stream was moving more quickly than usual, but not flooding or anything like that. So I had no clue why something like this would happen. I started to hop my way over the rocks and onto the branch bridge. But when my foot touched the far bank, 
I felt a flash of light overtake my vision and I fell flat on the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I'd thought I'd gone blind. I honestly wondered if I had hurt my eyes somehow. The world had fallen into complete darkness, even though it couldn't have been half past two in the afternoon. I managed to get myself back onto my feet and made my way back to the house. Luckily, I knew the property well and made it there without incident. I then flung open the door. There stood my mother and grandmother in the kitchen, and my grandmother was on the phone with the police. My brother was sitting quietly on the couch, but his head spun around as I opened the door. I could tell by looking at their faces that they had all been crying. Their cheeks were streaked and their eyes were red. My mom then asked where I had been and said I knew I wasn't allowed to be gone that long. Apparently, I had been gone for hours. I watched as her face moved between anger and being relieved to see me alive. I couldn't understand it at first because I only walked just about five minutes into the woods. They said they searched and called my name and went down to the brook, but they never saw any signs of me. I still don't know what happened, but I do believe that somehow I was caught in this time warp. There's no other reasonable explanation for what happened, except for something supernatural. I couldn't have fallen or gotten lost or disoriented because my family searched the area. They would have seen me because I didn't go that far. They would have literally had to step over my body if they were in the area of the creek. It is just impossible that I was near where they were looking and not some otherworldly place. Still, none of them believe me, and my mom was always very adamant that I do not share my story with teachers or friends. When I saw the videos on your channel about portals in the woods and energy fields, I realized that I wasn't alone in this experience, and my story was not and is not insane. I'm still looking for answers, but I'm just glad that I didn't lose too much time away from the real world. I never saw any other abnormalities in the stream, but I can't easily go back there and check it out because my grandmother ended up passing away a few years ago. After that, my family sold the property, but the new owners seem relatively kind. I am thinking of writing to them to see if they mind if I could visit and walk around. I'm not going to mention any strange incidents to them, but maybe I'll just say that I want to go back to the area of my childhood treehouse. That should work good enough. Either way, even if I go or not, surely there must be something more to this story and something paranormal going on with that creek. Hello Donovan. Here is a story from back when I lived in Washington, D.C. We lived in a small suburb which is split between Maryland and D.C., known as Tacoma Park. TKPK, as they call it, is known as a very progressive and kind of hippie village inside the beltway of DC. Some call it Berkeley of the East. We bought our first home there as it was relatively inexpensive to buy a home there at the time inside the beltway. This house was pretty old and sat atop a slight hill providing you a bit of an overlook towards downtown DC. You couldn't see much but an interesting view nonetheless. The property had a long staircase that was very steep leading to the front porch of the home. One night, as I was having a cigarette on the front porch around 1 a.m., at that time the neighbors would have been in bed, as to not see me smoking. I had my periods of being off and on, but for the most part, I don't smoke. As I was smoking, I began hearing this loud thumping sound, yet it was more of a clap than a thump. It sounded like someone was running with sneakers on, but there was something very unordinary about it. I looked around trying to identify the sound. When I peered down from the perch I had on our porch, to my surprise, there is a creature standing less than a foot running at an incredibly fast speed right down the middle of our avenue. It looked kind of like a Jesus lizard running across the water, but I could clearly see it had a small head and body like a human. Honestly, it happened so fast I can't really pinpoint a description. The area does have wildlife. It was common to have does and bucks and flying squirrels and foxes in our yard at times. Though I had never seen anything like that, especially darting down the middle of the road. To this day, I still haven't a clue as to what I saw. How are you, Donovan? 
I've been watching your channel for quite some time. I have two stories that fall under the strange or weird. The first one is a strange series of events a few weeks ago. I'm a bit of a night owl and I don't sleep until like 5 or 6 a.m. One night I had gone to sleep earlier, but as I was lying there I heard this strange noise outside my window. It was like a strange chirping noise around 4 a.m. There's no owls near my house. Cats occasionally wander in my neighborhood, but not near my house. I call it chirping, but it wasn't like how a bird chirps. It was more like two different sets of chirping. It sounded like two creatures talking. I use the term creatures because the next day I asked a family member to check the area as I had to work. I have a photo of a footprint I can't identify. No one in my house would be awake at that time, nor does it look like a shoe. I saw the area after I'd gotten out of work. It was still there and looks humanoid. I haven't heard anything like it since, but it's had me on alert. My second strange event happened in 2016 and nearby my house. I had gone for a walk in the summer and kind of lost track of time. It was near 9 p.m. and I was walking towards my neighborhood as I saw this strange being. It looked like it was camouflaged like the predator, but shaped like a person. It kind of took the shape of myself. It was about my height, around 5'7 and kind of thin. I could vaguely see through it. It was about 10 feet away from me. I was hesitant to move closer to it. I took a few steps to move closer. It started to disappear after I started moving closer to it. I finally walked home in a hurry and tried to put it out of my mind. Back in the mid-70s, I was given temporary duty orders to a school at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. This was a four-month school at the Navy Hospital there, so I was able to take my wife and our one-year-old daughter along with me. We were lucky enough to find an available one-bedroom apartment immediately off the causeway to the main gate of the base. This was an older apartment complex, probably about 30 years old or so. With our move and disruption to our lives, this gave our daughter some challenges and it was very hard for her to fall asleep in our bedroom. For weeks, she would often cry for hours and hours before she went to sleep. So one night, we decided to let her stay in the room and cry until she would finally fall asleep. My wife and I stayed in the living room watching the television with all of the lights off, except for the bathroom light. After a while, we heard a rattling noise from the front door. Thinking it was our neighbors coming home, we turned toward the door and noticed something very strange. Soon thereafter, our daughter stopped crying. After a few minutes, my wife turned to me and asked me if I saw something. I told her that I had. I saw an older woman in a nightgown float through the wall from the hallway and through the door to our bedroom. She was luminous and was indeed floating and not walking. My wife responded that this is exactly what she witnessed as well. It was immediately after that that our daughter stopped crying. From then on, she never had a problem falling asleep at night. Needless to say, my wife and I slept in the living room during the rest of our stay there in Florida. Once you witness something like that, there is no one that could ever convince either of us that ghosts don't exist. When I was in my last year of college, I got a placement at a hospital where I work with professionals on the adolescent psych ward. The director and I would do crafts and projects with the teens to help them have an outlet while they were getting treatment. We dealt a lot with mental illness and other medical issues. Every day before we'd see the teens, we'd get a rundown explaining who everyone was and what issues they were being hospitalized for. This one night, we were given the usual report and the nurse mentioned one teen in particular. This girl who I'll call Joni had all of a sudden just stopped talking and started to act really out of character. She wouldn't respond to family, friends, or doctors, or anyone. She was hospitalized because they became concerned about her harming herself and they were trying to ensure she was being watched 24-7. They were worried that she was experiencing some type of psychosis. From what I was told, they had checked and ruled out a brain tumor and other possible physiological causes and found nothing abnormal. 
This was a very old hospital with dark hallways, poorly lit rooms, and the most creepy atmosphere I've ever experienced. It looked like a hospital you'd see in a horror movie. When I walked down the hallways, I remember always being scared something would jump out at me because there was a lot of blind spots because it's a very old layout. Anyway, this night in particular, the director and I were getting things together for the residents in the kitchen room where we always did our activities. I was sitting close to Joni and tried to initiate conversation, but she would just stare at me blankly. The director tried as well, and Joni would not respond. Every now and then, she would just look at us and laugh loudly or smile at me with this glassy eyes. The doctors had tried all day to get her to speak, and she said nothing, so I just chatted and tried my best to include her, even though she wouldn't really engage. I started to doodle on a piece of paper while talking with some of the other teens. On my paper, I just randomly wrote down hi and drew a design around it, not even really thinking about what I was doing. Almost immediately after I wrote the word hi, Joni picked up the pencil and wrote hello. I was shocked to say the least. I was the first person in days she attempted to communicate with. I didn't know if it would work, but I wrote, how are you? and she actually wrote an answer. I was blown away. We exchanged a couple questions and answers. Within a few minutes, this girl and I had written almost a page of conversation, and she was communicating through writing with no trouble. Couldn't believe what was happening. I was getting all of this info from a girl that everyone thought was unreachable. We communicated through writing for what seemed like hours, but it was probably just about an hour. While I was asking her how she was feeling about being in the ward, she admitted through writing that she was scared. I kept going, trying to see if she was scared because she was in a strange place, or missed her family or what, but she wrote that it was because she saw people in the room with us. Obviously, there were people in the room with us, so I asked why the people in the room scared her. She wrote, because they're dead. I swear when I read that, it felt like my stomach hit the floor. I looked up from the page we were writing on, and she looked at me and then turned her head and stared at the door. No one was there. I mean, I didn't see anyone there. Joni stared at that door for at least a minute, and I swear she saw something there. I was more freaked out than I can even express. I'll never forget the look on her face. Whether or not there was someone there, Joni could definitely see someone. I tried to relax myself and once I got her attention back, we started communicating again through writing. We talked this way until 9 p.m. when my shift was over. She said that the dead people kept their distance from her when other people were around, but when she was in bed at night, they surrounded her and warned her not to even speak or they'd take her away. When I was leaving, I thanked Joni for speaking to me. I collected the papers we had written on and I showed the entire conversation to the director and the nurse in charge. Everyone on duty was freaked out by what it said. They assured me that the pages would be passed along to the psychiatrist the next morning. I was filled with so many emotions. I was happy I had spoken to her and she was honest with me, but I was really scared and shaken up. I got home and I remember walking into the living room and my roommates knew right away something was wrong. I was shaken and blurted out everything that had happened. They were supportive, but also freaked out by the situation. I had never been happier to have roommates. If I'd gone home to an empty place, I probably wouldn't have slept at all. Sadly, because of the schedule I had and all the different shift changes at the hospital, I didn't see Joni again and never found out what the final diagnosis was for her. I still get the chills when I think about that look on her face that night when she stared at that door. I don't think I'll ever shake that feeling. I just hope she got the help that she needed. When I was a kid, my dad had a hunting cabin in the middle of the woods. It was a tiny and simple one-room shack, really, but it was my favorite place to go in the world. My dad and I would get plenty of one-on-one -on -one bonding time and I would just forget about the rest of the world for a weekend at a time. My dad was an avid hunter, and I would go into the deer stand with him, but I more just enjoyed spending time with him and being out in nature. 
We had a couple of ATVs that we would bring and drive around for fun sometimes. They didn't go very fast, but it was a fun way to explore the woods and get some wind in your hair, especially as a kid. One day I was relaxing outside and I heard this awful roaring sound. I figured it might be a wounded animal and got on my ATV to go investigate. I took off in the direction of the sound and ended up going deep into the woods. I turned my engine off and tried to be as quiet as possible and listened for the sound again. The forest was quieter than I've ever heard it before. Usually you could hear all kinds of insects and all the sounds from wildlife around there, but right then it was weirdly quiet. I listened for a while and then I figured it must have died. I turned on the ATV and started making my way back up to the house when I heard the roaring again but this time it was way louder. It was coming from right behind me. The sound was the worst thing I've ever heard. It was this ferocious roar, but it sounded like a wolf's howling too, like a combination of a lion and a wolf with a little bit of a demonic growl. It absolutely freaked me out. I just wanted to get out of there, but I was frozen with fear. I slowly looked behind me and there was nothing there. I debated what I should do. Either I get out of there and go to the cabin for safety, or I get a look at what we're dealing with so my dad can shoot it and get rid of it. My curiosity got the best of me, and I headed toward the sound. I heard this awful clicking, bleeding sound, and I flashed my headlights on to see what it was. Standing on its hind legs in front of me was this giant, furry, humanoid creature with what looked like huge goat horns on its head. This thing must have been about six or seven feet tall. It had this thick hair all over its muscular body, and it had these creepy wide blue eyes and it was staring right at me. Suddenly it let out this terrifying roar and charged right at me. I took off on the ATV and I could hear it running and grunting and clicking behind me. I was able to get to a part of the woods I was pretty familiar with, and started driving as unpredictably as I could while heading back to the cabin. I finally got back to the cabin. I sprinted inside and slammed the door and locked it behind me. My dad asked me what was the matter. I told him that I heard these crazy sounds and then I went to investigate. I told him that I saw this giant goat man and it tried to kill me. I didn't think he'd believe me at first, but when he heard its demonic roar outside the cabin, it was close enough that we actually felt the vibrations of its horrific sound. My dad grabbed a shotgun and charged outside to shoot this beast, but it was nowhere to be found. He told me to stay inside and lock the door, and he walked around the cabin to try to find the beast. About 15 minutes passed, and he came back in and said he couldn't find a single trace of this creature. He asked me where I first found it, and I tried to tell him where, but I was pretty shaken up. We made our way down to where I'd first seen it, slowly and quietly. My dad had the shotgun and the flashlight ready. We eventually made it all the way down to the spot, but the creature was still nowhere to be found, and my dad couldn't track him at all. We made our way back to the cabin and I told him what the thing looked like. We researched it, and then about a week later, to my astonishment, there are thousands of accounts of people around Maryland and Pennsylvania and Texas who have all seen this tall, half goat, half human. It's famously referred to as the goat man. I couldn't believe it. The physical description of what all these people saw matches what I saw. Seven feet tall, muscular, fur all over its body, huge goat horns and wide set eyes. They also claim that they heard the same thing I did. This bleeding, clicking, roaring and howling. It was very validating to hear that so many people had the same experience as me, but it made me wonder why this information wasn't more well known. Is it possible that the people in power are trying to hide the existence of such creatures from the public in order to control us? I'm writing from a small town in Louisiana. It's to the southeast of New Orleans, about 45 minutes and we have a lot of bayous out there. A bayou is kind of swamp-like. The water moves slowly and it can be marshy or lake-like, but it's never really deep. 
A lot of people out this way go into bayous to fish or to hunt, and I grew up in a family that did the same. My uncle actually ran a business that took groups out into the bayou on an airboat. It was a really small business and mostly for sightseeing alligators, which are very common in Louisiana waterways. If you're from the area, you're familiar with the general safety around alligators and know just how prevalent they are. It's not really a concern for the locals, but tourists love seeing alligators. And it was a quick way for my uncle to make money and to get to spend his days outside. When my uncle was running the airboat, usually four days a week for a few hours a day, I was in college a few hours away and would come home on the weekends. I liked college, but it was draining for me to be in a bigger city and more populated area too. So it was nice to come home and relax a little. Plus, the food was a lot better. On one of my visits home, we had a fried chicken dinner to celebrate midterms being over. My younger brother, who was going off to college the next year, was stirring up a lot of trouble and making everybody laugh. Some of my little cousins were there too, but my Aunt Cheryl said my uncle was taking out the last boat of tourists for the day. It was maybe a little afternoon at this point, so we were all helping getting dinner ready shucking corn and mixing the batter, all that kind of stuff, or watching football and hanging out. I thought it'd just be another weekend at home, but about 45 minutes later, my uncle showed up looking really distressed. Now, my uncle is a pretty fun-loving guy. He's always got a joke in his back pocket, and he loves to wrestle and mess around. He's great with his kids and just kids in general. But when he stepped into my parents' house, he was out of breath and looked strained like his face was a purple red color. My first thought was that there was something wrong with him. My grandma and aunt had him sit down and were fussing around him. My brother and I both noticed what was going on. So we popped into the kitchen from watching football and hung out around the back, trying to pick up what was going on. He drank an entire glass of Coke and the sugar seemed to help him. When he loosened up a little and everyone was going back to their work, he finally admitted he had seen something strange in the bayou. Not just him, but five tourists he had on the airboat too. He was giving the usual tour when he saw a ripple of water down a side waterway that looked like a decent sized alligator breaking the surface. That waterway was narrow and not on his usual route, but he decided to head down there anyway due to the possibility of seeing a big gator. They'd mostly seen young adults, the teenagers of the gator world who are long and thin. So he had maneuvered the airboat carefully down that channel and had everyone keep an eye out for a bigger gator, probably hanging around the surface or the shore areas. I interrupted him and asked him how far out he was, and he said it was maybe 20 minutes from his dock. He was on a roll now, vomiting the whole story out and revealed out a younger kid in the group, maybe 10 or 12. He called out and pointed. My uncle cut the engine and they drifted back while he looked. He obviously has a great eye for gators and saw what the kid was pointing out, but it looked wrong to him. First of all, the scales were a darker blue-green color than a gator's and less raised and ridged. They weren't smooth, but close to it. The thing they were looking at was up under a bald cypress with a fair amount of moss hanging off the lower broken branches. So it wasn't immediately clear. As they drifted by a few feet, the creature was about eight or 10 feet away from them. My uncle got a clear look and started the engine back up right away. What he saw wasn't an alligator, but what looked like a lizard man rising half out of the bayou. He was reaching up and gripping the cypress and trying to hide his face. But my uncle could see that his arms were human arms with webbed hands, not the awkward short legs of a gator. It was harder for him to see the face, but he saw a hole on the side of the head that many lizards have as ears, and a snout that was much shorter than a gator's, and like I said, less ridged. The creature was obviously trying to avoid being seen, and my uncle was freaked out, so he drew everyone's attention to the other side of the channel, but a last glimpse showed him that the lizard man was wearing a very tattered shirt and was soaked. He figured a different way back to his dock so they wouldn't have to pass that area. I asked if it was because he wanted the creature to escape, and he said yes, but I think he also just didn't want to see it again. Not too long after that, the tourist season died down a bit, and I was back at college. 
My uncle eventually decided to shut down his business and work as an auto service tech instead. He's happy he stays busy now, but that thing must have really freaked him out because he loved going on the bayou. I have a story to tell, but it could potentially get me into some trouble. So I'm going to leave out any clearly identifying details in the hopes it stays anonymous enough that there won't be any blowback. What I will say is this. Many years ago, I worked as a detective for the state police in a state where there are several Native American reservations. Often, we would get called to assist the reservation police on cases that were too complicated for them to solve with their limited resources. As with most things on the reservation, their police forces are often underfunded and limited staff. This particular case was what appeared to be a homicide. A guy from the reservation, one that none of the neighbors particularly liked, was found evidently beaten to death out in the middle of an otherwise empty field. He was wearing sweats and a t-shirt, no shoes, and looked like he had been pulled right off the couch, except for the fact that the bottoms of his feet were so worn out. He had been running for a long time before whatever happened out there happened. That was the only strange thing about this case, though. It had rained earlier in the day, and we were able to find his footprints in the mud several places leading from his house to the open area where his body was found. The back door of his house was wide open when we got there, and his barefooted tracks were in the mud right from the start. He hadn't been pulled off the couch. He was chased off the couch. Only, there was only one set of human footprints. I repeat, only one human set of track. At several points along the way, we also found what appeared to be large deer tracks running alongside his. When I say large deer tracks, I don't mean large like an elk. I mean large like a human-sized foot, but hooved like a deer. These tracks were also in the front yard, though. In fact, right by the living room window, which had been shattered from the outside. The general consensus among most of the investigators was that someone had come to settle a score with him, and since it was close to Halloween, the assumption was that they had been wearing some kind of costume to freak him out. It was his brother who told me there was another explanation, but once you hear it, you'll understand why I never bothered to present it to my co-workers as a possibility. It's absolutely crazy sounding, but my personal belief is that it is true. You see, this guy had been poaching for as long as he had been old enough to hold a gun. He didn't have a lot of respect for wildlife or game laws and used some pretty unethical hunting practices, like baiting and spotlighting deer while out on his hunts. He told his brother that one night he was out trying to bait a buck in when he came face to face with a wendigo but somehow managed to escape. The problem with escaping a wendigo, though, is that according to folklore, you never really do. Once a wendigo has set its sights on you, it doesn't give up. This guy had about made himself crazy over the last few months, telling his brother about how this wendigo was following him around. He quit his job over it when the thing kept showing up at work. He'd even stopped leaving the house for the most part, and had been pretty close to a hermit status at the time he was killed. The brother's thoughts was that the Wendigo got tired of waiting for the guy to come back out of his house and took matters into its own hands, breaking out the front window and running the guy out the back door. I know what you're thinking. The guy was a kook afraid of a Wendigo. The proof for me is in what was found in the broken glass of that broken window. Not only was there blood and short deer hairs all cut up in the glass, but at one place in the shattered remains of the glass, there was a thin strip of satin, the exact kind you pull off a deer's antlers. This guy messed around poaching animals under unfair and horrifying circumstances, and in the end, he got exactly what he deserved in return. In the winter of 2002, I was a police officer in Athens, Ohio, home of Ohio University. As any cop in a small college town will tell you, Thursday nights can get a little wild. Most of the kids leave campus on Friday night to head home and visit their parents. 
so Thursday nights rain as party nights on campuses. I want to say it was mid-December and the last Thursday before finals week and subsequent Christmas break, making it the wildest Thursday night of the year. Ohio University is home to four fraternities and three sororities. Needless to say, most of our Thursday night calls, most of our Thursday night calls centered around the inhabitants of one of the more popular frat houses. In recent months, most of our calls to that fraternity had been centered around a series of practical jokes played on the elderly man who lived across the alley. He had made a few noise complaints and it had created a sort of an ongoing battle between him and the fraternity. I personally had been called out at least a half dozen times to deal with these issues, and I can't even begin to guess how many other officers had been sent to deal with the same stuff on their shifts. The old guy's name was Eugene, and it would be unfair of me to make him out as some sweet innocent man, fallen victim to the immaturity of boys that lived in the frat house. Eugene was a troublemaker too, and had a rap sheet as long as my arm from a lifetime of petty crime and he certainly got his own blows in during the dispute. Between the fraternity poisoning Eugene's garden with Roundup and Eugene hitting the back windows of their house with a pellet gun, there were at least a dozen other instances of back and forth jabs that had turned from humorous to downright uncivil over time. A few weeks before the night in question though, the battle came to an abrupt end when Eugene suffered a heart attack and died watching a football game at his sister's house. The whole street had been quiet since he left, and somewhat ironically, the fraternity had held off their partying for a few weeks, out of respect for Eugene. It seemed like a worthless gesture, since what he really would have liked was for the partying to let up while he was alive, but myself and the other officers appreciated a few weeks of quiet patrols. I knew they wouldn't skip the Friday before finals though so I was ready to handle some more complaints when I checked into work that night. It wasn't long before I got the first call out to the fraternity. Not by a neighbor reporting noise though, this call from the boys at the frat house themselves. When I got there, they told me they had been setting up for a party and someone had stolen a keg off the back porch. I chalked it up to a college prank and told them the keg would likely resurface later or at another frat party. They weren't happy with me, but they couldn't argue. They knew by now how these things worked. I got back into my car and answered a couple more calls, a domestic dispute across town, and a Christmas tree that had caught fire. Then I was getting ready to park and wait for my next interaction. I got dispatched back to the fraternity a second time. Again, the call came from the frat boys themselves. When I got there, everyone was huddled in the living room, toward the front of the house. The back door which faced the alley had been blown right off its hinges and was laying flat on the floor in the kitchen. The door facing and all was still attached. I asked what happened, but nobody seemed to really know. They were hanging out and drinking, they said, when suddenly the whole thing flew into the house like a gust of wind had hit it, but there hadn't been any strong winds. The streamers on the back porch were still undisturbed. I looked at the door and there was no evidence that it had been kicked in. It was really puzzling to me. It was really puzzling, and I was beginning to wonder if the partiers weren't playing a prank on me. It was about that time that someone who was standing and looking out the hole where the back door used to be noticed someone walking in Eugene's backyard. I turned and looked just in time to catch it too. It was clearly a person hunched over and sneaking behind the old shed behind Eugene's place, so I called out for them to stop. I knew nobody was supposed to be over there. I talked to Eugene's sister just the day before, and she told me she wasn't planning to start cleaning the house until after Christmas passed. The figure never came back though, nor did they emerge from the other side. I decided to head over and have a look. The snow had been falling on a few separate occasions since Eugene passed, and his backyard was blanketed in snow. There weren't even squirrel tracks anywhere to be seen, and certainly not adult human footprints either. There was no person hiding behind the shed and there was no indication that anyone had been over there at all. I shrugged it off thinking maybe me and the witness both had been seeing things, shadows from all the Christmas lights and trees around the area. But as I turned with my flashlight, I caught a glimpse of something through the window of the shed. There in the floor in the middle of that locked shed 
sat the stolen keg from earlier. I knew it was the same keg because their fraternity name was written in black marker on the side of it when they put it on reserve. I never told the kids, I just left it there and let Eugene have the last word. Hi Donovan, I've really been loving your channel. I always thought there were crazy things happening behind the scenes of normal life. And I love that so many people were willing to contribute here. When I was in college in the Washington DC area, I worked part time at a country club. It was nice to have extra cash, but I also got golfing privileges with the job. One night we were closing up, which entailed cleaning the last few things and setting things out for the morning. I was working in the dining room and looking out the window. Outside the room we worked in was a small hill that overlooked a golf course. I saw that my coworker had apparently finished what he was doing and was out there messing around with a club at the top of the hill. The window was open and I heard him calling down and asking us to come look because he thought he was seeing things. There were around four or five of us that night and we climbed up the hill and looked off down the course. It was a typical clear summer night with a fair number of stars out, but one of the stars looked too close and it was moving. At first we figured it must have been a plane, but it was changing directions in a way too extreme of a fashion. It would hover and then dart all the way across our field of view. We couldn't tell how far away it was and we couldn't rationalize how any conventional aircraft could do what we were seeing. After watching it for a good five minutes or so, we convinced ourselves that maybe it was just some kind of optical illusion or something. We left the hill and finished up closing. When we were done, we went up the hill again to see if it was still there. It was. And now it was either brighter or it was closer. At that point, we decided we wanted to stick around to watch this thing. A couple of the people that we were with went inside to get food for us, and the rest of us just sat down on the hill and watched. For another 15 minutes or so, we watched this thing go from side to side across the sky, and then it hovered in place. And we all agreed it seemed like it was getting closer. At around the time our friends came back, the light changed. It seemed like it was spiraling. It was definitely getting closer. It seemed to be coming toward the country club. But then, it suddenly stopped in midair. Its lights got bigger and bigger. It very rapidly appeared to be losing altitude and then again it just stopped, switching directions completely and then accelerating faster than anything I've ever seen in the complete opposite direction. We were mesmerized. We ate our food and when we were done, for some crazy reason we decided to start running toward it to see if we could get a better look. We ran down the hill and up the fairway toward the light. It veered over the woods alongside the course and we ran after it. At this point, we were following it and the woods were lit up enough from the glow that you didn't need to worry about running into the trees. We were all excited and yelling about what it could be, but I think that was mainly to cover up the fact that we were all actually really nervous, but no one wanted to admit it. All of a sudden, it stopped and zoomed down sort of above us. Not directly, but enough to really freak us out. And then it just hovered there. It was low enough now that we could see these five red circles on the bottom. There were two circles sitting above three others, like in a trapezoid shape. It was making a loud sort of thrusting sound. After it hovered there for a few minutes, the light shut off and it went completely silent. We could still see the shape of where it was, like a pitch black darkness above us. And then after a few more minutes of just hovering there, it zoomed off over the horizon with these five red lights at the rear. It flew like a rock from a slingshot. It was over the horizon in just a few seconds. In the dark, it looked like a short, fat triangle. And then there was nothing. We were all gasping from running. While we were standing there trying to make sense of it all, all of a sudden these two fighter jets flew over at extremely low altitude, right over our heads. About three minutes later, we all saw multiple military jets and helicopters traveling in the same direction the lights had disappeared. At that point, we all just silently agreed to go back to the club. Of course, we never saw anything mentioned on the news or anything like that. I've thought about it often over the years. I still keep in touch with a couple of the people that I was with that night. 
and we all have the same memory of what happened. I doubt we'll ever get any satisfying answers about all the covert stuff that must be going on out there, but I kind of want to see something like that again. I'm always checking out the night sky just in case. I saw something out in Buzzards Bay in Massachusetts that really freaked me out. My buddy and I were out fishing there last Sunday, and we saw something break the surface about 20 feet away from us. He said dolphin. I said, nah, it's a whale. But then it got closer and we got another look. It was a weird blue-green color, and when it rose up a little, it looked like it had a hump on its back. But it was shimmery, and not the color of a whale or a dolphin a brighter color, like those fancy tropical fish you can buy. So we were thinking that it was some sort of floating trash that was reflecting the light. I don't know, just bobbing up from the current or something. But the weird thing was, it kept getting closer to us, way faster than the current would bring it. Then it stopped. It disappeared for a few minutes, and I was guessing that it had sunk. A few minutes later, we're just chilling, kicking back with our rods, and the strangest thing started happening. The water began to swirl around us, maybe in a 15-foot perimeter with us in the middle, little waves cresting and going in a circle around us. I never saw anything like it, and neither had my buddy, because he sat right up saying, what the hell? At first I laughed because he's this big guy and he looked a little nervous, while I was thinking there had to be a rational explanation, like we were caught in a school of blue fish or something. But it started getting closer, like the circle was closing in on us. The waves going around us seemed like they were getting taller. Not really tall, but rising enough to make me put down my rod and grab the side of the boat. Now, my boat ain't big. It's a 16-footer. But the force from whatever this was started making the boat swivel too. We weren't spinning fast or anything, but we were doing a circle. By then, we were both like, what the hell is going on here? And I said, you want to get out of here? And he said, yeah. So I tried to fire up the motor, which is a 60 horsepower Yamaha four stroke that I just got a year ago. That thing's never given me any trouble, but it wouldn't start. I mean, completely dead. The water was choppy and the boat had started rocking a little because the waves were spinning us faster around. I just gave up on the motor after about eight tries because I was freaking out now too. We just needed to move now. I grabbed an oar and he grabbed the other one and we paddled right out of that spinning circle. I was pretty relieved because I had this terrible fear that the waves were going to get higher and trap us in. Yeah, I know that sounds ridiculous, but you had to be there. We waited a few minutes and couldn't even see the whirlpool thing anymore. And my buddy said, you want to go in? I'm thinking that's a long way to paddle and pretty soon someone's going to come by. It's a well-traveled area, and they could give us a tow. And the weirdness had disappeared, right? So I just said, let's wait, and we cast out our lines again. It was just like two minutes later that something big took the bait, and my rod bent almost double. I'm thinking it's a striper. You know, it was only five years ago when that fella caught a 65-pound striper right here in Buzzards Bay. Whatever it was, it was wicked big. I was afraid if I didn't tire out, my rod was going to snap. So I let it run a bit, then reeled it in some. I did that a few times. It started going soft, getting tired. So I took up a lot of slack all at once, pulling that sucker in right quick before it caught a second wind. It got closer and closer, and the damnest thing started happening. The whirlpool thing was back, circling around the boat. I was like, screw this. I'm still getting my fish. So I just kept pulling it in. But then suddenly, I could see what I'd caught. I saw it through the water about six feet down. It was no damn fish. This thing had a bunch of legs like an octopus, maybe not eight. I wasn't stopping to count, but more than four, almost like tentacles. And it was this iridescent color between blue and green. The body wasn't round either. It was long and skinny and tapered on one end. I yelled to my buddy to get his camera ready. I needed him to get a picture as soon as I brought the thing up, because I could already tell this was going to be one of those times no one will believe you unless you got a picture. So he grabs his phone and leans over the side a bit. Then he sees it and says, what in the hell is that? 
As soon as he says that, the thing rolls over, and I can suddenly see its head. I couldn't believe it, even though it was right in front of me. This thing had a face. Not a human face, but not a reptile face either. Like a human-reptile crossbreed. The only reference I can think of is the creature from the Black Lagoon, except it had all these crazy tentacle legs. The thing was looking right at me, with these big flat black eyes, and I froze. I stopped pulling. I didn't want this thing any closer. No way. But I yelled to my buddy, take a picture through the water now. As soon as I shouted, one of the legs came right up and smacked hard into the side of the boat, right next to where my friend's leaning over. I swear, I thought this thing was going to grab a hold of him. He stumbled back, dropping his phone and making us rock so hard I thought we were going to capsize. That's when I let my rod go, crouching down and hanging on with both hands, because no way did I want to be in the water with that thing. The boat steadied, so I leaned over to look over the edge just a little. I couldn't see it anymore. It must have dove down once I let the rod go. But I decided to cut the line. My buddy yelled, what the hell are you doing? But man, that thing looked meaner than an eel and must have weighed 80 or 90 pounds. Just judging from its creepy face and the way it moved, it seemed to have intelligence. I wasn't going to play around with it. That was some sort of supernatural something, and I didn't want to mess with it. Anyway, the whirlpool around us was gone now too, so maybe it created that somehow. Or maybe there was more of them around us. Jeez, that's a scary thought. Okay, and another weird thing is, when I tried to fire up the motor a minute later, it worked. It cranked up on the second try. Maybe a coincidence. Well, that's it. When I started attending college in Boston, I spent my freshman year in the dorms. It was a valuable experience overall, but it just wasn't for me. I didn't realize what an introvert I was until I was surrounded by people in activity 24-7, so I decided to find an apartment for my second year. After a bit of looking, I finally found someone who seemed compatible who was looking for a roommate. The place was a little farther from the college than I liked, but I decided to go with it. Before I signed the lease, my roommate told me that the building was built on the site of an old mental hospital. She said she wanted me to be fully informed ahead of time. I guess I thought it was a nice gesture, but I also wondered if I had been better off not knowing. I asked her if that information had affected her somehow. She said not really, but sometimes she got strange feelings when going in and out of the building, and that she'd also heard some weird sounds on occasion. I didn't really believe in all of that stuff. I was just happy to be out of the crazy party atmosphere at the dorm. Too many freshmen apparently had been overprotected in high school and were going crazy without their parents around. Anyway, there were a few other students living in the building, so we got a group together for carpooling back and forth to school. One evening, we had all decided to go into town. Two of us were waiting in the lobby for the rest of the group to get downstairs. I was just standing there looking around the lobby as I never really stopped there much before. And I noticed that there was this closet near the front door, and it was a bit open. I mean, I assumed it was a closet door. It wasn't labeled or anything. And I'd never seen it open. Anyway, I went over to take a peek inside, and it was open. Turns out, it wasn't a closet. It was a stairway. I called to my friend who was waiting with me. We looked down into the darkness, but there was no light switch at the top to turn on. We then looked at each other and said, what the hell? and we both headed down the stairs. We walked down slowly, me going first, feeling along the wall the entire way down. Eventually, I felt a light switch at the bottom which I flipped on. Part of me didn't expect it to work, but I was pleasantly surprised when it did. We stopped and looked straight ahead, both of us looking into what looked like the entrance to a tunnel. That really surprised us, but then we heard others upstairs in the lobby and agreed that we didn't have time to check it out right then. We went back up the stairs and found the others waiting there. We had told them about the stairway, and everyone agreed that we should check it out when we got back. So we headed out and spent a few hours eating and talking about school, then we decided to head back home. When we got back, we all agreed we still wanted to check out the tunnel, so all five of us went down there together to explore. 
We followed the tunnel for quite a while, and then we came out into what looked like a hospital room, but like a really old one, not modern at all. There were hospital beds and bedpans and a variety of hospital equipment, but really old style stuff, like metal and no plastic anywhere. We found a closet full of straight jackets. In fact, we only knew what they were from seeing them in movies. It was all very strange, but in addition, there was also something out of place. And then it dawned on me. Even though the instruments were old, a lot of them were laid out on trays and looked really clean, like someone was getting ready to use them. And on one of the counters, I found an old note saying, give 300 milligrams if any problems. I wasn't sure what it was, but I was thinking 300 milligrams could be a lot depending on what it was. There were all these old wheelchairs lined up along the walls, and there was a bicycle down there, but it didn't look that old. We wandered around not knowing what to think of it all, sort of in total surprise and taking it all in. There were a lot of rooms. It sort of seemed abandoned, and yet the electricity worked in all the rooms. Finally, we got to a far room when we opened the door. It smelled terrible. My friend reached around and flicked on the light, and instantly we noticed what looked like huge paw prints on the wall. I don't know anything about animal tracks, but these things were too big to belong to anything average sized. There was an examination table in there, and there was blood on the walls. The room really freaked me out. I was imagining something trying to escape from the exam room, like there had been a fight and that caused the handprints on the walls. I think what really freaked me out is the smell kind of seemed fresh. Then I heard one of my friends shouting. I ran toward his voice. He had gone all the way down to the far end of the hallway and had reached a place where the tunnel resumed. I heard this loud growling coming from where he was, and as I approached him, I could see a gate with iron bars closing off the tunnel. Looking further, I could see that some kind of beast was behind the gate. It started howling and snarling and throwing itself against the bars. It looked incredibly angry. It was trying to break down the gate. Its teeth were incredible. I swear it had a double row of teeth and these horrible fangs. It was standing upright and it was massively hairy, but I couldn't even figure out what it was. If it was an animal or a demon or even a mutant human. It had a short snout and a big hump back. It had to be over six feet tall but not much more, and the smell was unbearable now that we were closer, like rotting meat. We stared at each other, none of us saying much, just breathing heavily and finally I yelled, let's get the hell out of here. We ran back towards the stairs in the lobby, back past all the rooms and back through the tunnel until we finally reached the stairway. We stopped there and all I could say was, what in the hell was that? My roommate was like, what are we going to do? We ended up back in our apartment and thought about who to call. At this hour, we figured only the police would respond, so we ended up calling them. When they arrived, two officers headed down the stairway and were gone for at least 20 or more minutes. All we could hear down there was them calling out hello, but nothing else. Eventually, they both came back up looking like they had seen a ghost. Then, they taped everything off and took all of our contact information, all five of us. They sent us back upstairs and said they would get a hold of us later, but we never heard from them again. We tried to access a police report about that night, but we can't find anything. We were told that someone will get in touch with us about it, but we were never called. We've tried going there and getting it ourselves too, but everything just leads to a dead end. Some of us have even given up and moved on, but me, I'm going to keep trying to get some answers. Hi Donovan, this story took place when I was about 16. It was 2009 in South Carolina, a little early in the morning before the sun came up. Every morning I would take our dog out to his runner before I left for school so he could have some time outside. My mom was home that day so she was able to watch him while he was out there. I noticed while on the way out to the runner, I saw over the trees to my left a set of three lights spaced out evenly that I had never seen before in that direction. We lived in a very rural area, so there were no big buildings, no water towers in that direction, nothing other than woods. I'd lived there for years, so I really know what's in that area. 
I noticed them since the lights weren't that far away. I tried to listen to a sound as to try to figure out what those things were. Being down in South Carolina, we do have a lot of naval and air bases in the area. So I tried to see if it was some type of plane, even though the planes I've seen never had those type of lights. I should also mention that the lights did periodically turn off and came back on in order from left to right. I stood there quietly for about three minutes staring at these lights, noticing that there's no sound. They don't move in any direction. I eventually had to take the dog to the runner so I could catch my bus in time. So the runner was about 25 feet away from the spot I was standing in. From the runner, I could not see the area where the lights were. So I made sure to clip him quickly and run back to the spot so I'd have a chance to watch it for another moment before my bus came. It was a very short span of time. I'd say about 30 seconds, and by the time I rushed back to the spot, the lights were gone. With the lights I've seen from other people's encounters and pictures, I can definitely say that this was a UFO spacecraft, and also my first that I've seen. I've never saw those lights in that area again. I did mention it to my mother since she and I always believed in things that weren't believed by many others. She never mentioned that she saw anything like that, but at least if she ever saw them, she would know that she's not the only one. Looking back now, even though it was early morning, I heard no birds or wildlife in the area. My dog was noticing my behavior, but I feel he also sensed something was not quite right. Thank you for telling our stories, Donovan. Be safe and take care.